All right, well, I'm going to uh, cover what is one of my favorite subjects of all time, favorite subjects, uh, uh, especially in biology, but uh, one of my very favorite subjects is the subject of animals. I just, I love animals. I've always been a big animal lover. Uh, in fact, uh, animals uh, uh, was one of my earliest memories. Seeing, I can, as earliest memory, as far as I know, um, when I was a really small child, was going out the back door of my, uh, my parents' house and they were seeing uh, several animals outside. There was a moth on the screen door. When I went out, there's a tortoise on the porch. And then there was a bird up on the fence. Marty's memories was seeing animals. And one of my fr first career thoughts was to have a zoo, you know? And I sketched out a zoo that included an alligator pit. Because apparently, when you're a kid, you think alligators are in pits. I had a big pit for my alligators and stuff. But I've always been a big animal lover. I, I, uh, I mean, I've had all sorts of animals. I, I even have, right now in my classroom, I have snakes. We moved recently to, to the other campus. I had to get rid of my, but I had saltwater tanks and freshwater tanks and dogs and cats. I'll, sh I'll show you a picture of my dogs at some point, but I, I got myself up to five dogs at one point. You know, when I lived in uh, Oklahoma, I had a big... Uh, big acre in Oklahoma, and I let that get a little bit out of control on me. And when I moved here, I moved here with four dogs. And uh, if you've never tried to find a rental house when you have four dogs, well, uh, I tell you what, the only house that you can get when you have four dogs is a dog house, literally. A house that, you know, uh, the only person, people that, the only house that someone will rent you when you have four dogs is a house that can't get any worse. <laughs> you know, so I just had to suffer with that. But I love my animals. And I'm Love cats just as much as dogs. Some people are like one or the other, but to me that's just uh, that's just crazy because the cats are different. But man, I love cats as well as dogs, and and um, and I think as as we look through this, I think you'll uh, come to appreciate them even more because animals are truly one of our most loved parts of the of the creation. It's a picture of my dogs, no longer with me. Um, they all died of old age, but that's Willie and Eli and Chelsea when I back in my house over in Briar. <clears throat> And, uh, we used to have a, our campus was in Malik Terrace, but um, and they are indeed one of uh, the most loved parts of the of the creation, and and they were a tremendous gift to us, a tremendous gift uh, from our uh, loving Father in heaven. There's there's nothing about the creation that captures our attention more than animals to to me. They are just wonderfully beautiful, elegant, graceful in the way they move. We just love watching them. I, re I remember not long ago, I took a, a hike up to Lake 22. When I first moved here, when I, I went and uh, did a hike up to Lake 22, and uh, this beautiful lake, one of the most pristine sights I'd ever seen in my life, just a beautiful crystal clear lake with the uh, you know, waters, falls coming over the edge and ref uh, water that was so reflective, you couldn't already tell where the, where the sky ended and the lake began. It's just a beautiful scene, beautiful scene, one of the be most beautiful things I'd ever seen. But then a little chipmunk jumped up on the rock next to me, and before I knew it, that scene was gone, and this little chipmunk captured my attention. But I mean, most of the animals today exist uh, in a distances from us, out on your inner tropical rainforest or your, your coral reefs. We don't really know how many animals there are on the Earth. The number of species is still highly debated. Um, it's, uh, some argue that somewhere between one and three million, but uh, the range just goes up all the way to 30 million because of the uncertainty of how many insects there are. The estimate on the number of insect species ranges from one to 30 million. So uh, could, be, uh, could be up to those kind of numbers. But it's sad that we don't see a lot of them anymore where we live because of the habitat destruction. You know, we've built our concrete uh, jungles over where they used to live. And even when you go take one of these hikes, I can go all the way up to a hike and back and never see a single animal. But uh, when you do, oh, look, there's a deer, you know? So it's just one of the, our, our our favorite parts of the creation, for sure. Well, we're, always, we're finding new animals all the time. Uh, this is an unknown mollusk that was discovered off the coast of Monterey Bay in 2000. Uh, not really sure what it, what it was, but uh, uh, speculated to be a, probably a species of nudibranch. This is uh, also a newly discovered shark. This is a, a shark species they called the ninja lantern shark, called the uh, ninja shark because it's pitch black and called the uh, lant ninja lantern shark because it has bioluminescent structures. A lot of animals, especially animals down in the deep dark, have these structures that emit light. 
That's what these are. They emit light. So the purpose of these is they emit a faint blue light. So whenever this shark gets in, into shallower waters that uh, start get, casting a little, where you're going to get a little sunlight, that blue light that they emit helps them blend into the uh, lighter waters that you see there. Well, one of my favorite areas of animal biology is, uh, is animal behavior. Uh, because of the tremendous intelligence that is demonstrated by our observations of animal behaviors. Um, animals are tremendously intelligent. And uh, th those that have been around mammals a lot, if you've had dogs or been around horses, we know how intelligent these are. But uh, I will illustrate some intelligence in one of our, I guess, least intelligent animals. That's some of the insects, um, like your ants. I mean, insects like your ants and bees don't really even have a brain. They have what's called a ganglia, just a cluster of nerve cell bodies up in the head, but not, not what we would call a brain. But uh, despite this, they exhibit some really, really complex behaviors. You might not know that, uh, that ants are involved in horticulture, or actually what we might think of as farming. The ants are actually involved in farming. Now, these are the leafcutter ants. They were called this because uh, you can't already see them there. It looks like just a bunch of leaves, but underneath all those leaves, there's ants carrying those leaves. Uh, this was observed and, uh, long ago, and uh, it was assumed that when, when, these, when they saw these ants cutting these chunks of leaves out of, uh, out of trees and walking off with them to their den, that they were eating the leaves. Anyone would assume that why would the ants be cutting leaves and hauling them off their den unless they were eating the leaves? Well, we come to find out they're not eating the leaves. Instead, they're using them to feed their underground garden. Now, one of the big mysteries about uh, some of these colonial behaviors like ants is, uh, is how they know, they know what to do. They all seem to know what to do and exactly when to do it. The big mystery is, who's in charge? Where's the foreman? But as you can see in these videos, these ants are chewing up these leaves. They chew this le these leaves up into a mulch, and they use this to feed the underground garden of fungus. There's also ants that are engaged, engaged in animal husbandry. Or like what you would think of as ranching. Uh, here I say they have pets because uh, um, of uh, the illustration I'm giving you here. You might not recognize this, but this little, uh, this little ant pet was uh, featured in uh, the Disney movie A Bug's Life. And uh, in this cartoon movie, the queen in this movie had a little pet that, jet, that hopped around like a little dog that she called Aphy. Well, what it is is an aphid. Ants actually keep herds of aphids. Here you see some ants with their herd of aphids. They uh, keep these aphids underground. Even during the winter, they keep them underground and care for them. Then when it comes springtime, they will take their aphids out to pasture. They let their, uh, walk their ants around. And uh, what, they, what the aphids do is they will drill into plants with their proboscis along the mouth part, drill into plants, suck out the juices, and then they will exude, exude that as a substance they call honeydew. And the, the ants eat this honeydew. But it's incredible. Now, I've seen this many times uh, and saw it once in my backyard. I, I knew what they, that they were engaged in this behavior, and when I saw ants up in a bush, I stopped and took a close look at what they were doing, and they were there with their herd of aphids. So if you ever see this, if you ever see ants up in a bush, crawling up in a bush, stop and take a look, chances are you will see them with their herd of aphids. Animals are also engaged in some tremendous construction projects. These are the leaf weaver ants, called that because instead of digging underground tunnels to make their nests, or whatever we call their underground uh, areas, they uh, make weave uh, leaves together up in the rainforest's trees. And they do this in areas where there's a lot of rain, and where you have a lot of rain, you can get your tunnels flooded out, and so they've taken to building these nests up in the trees. But it's a tremendous construction uh, project that they're, that they're engaged in. And again, um, one of the big mysteries is how they, how they know what to do. These hive-type animals, like your bees and ants, are described as having a hive mentality. They all seem to know what each other is doing and exactly who, what they should be doing at any given time. Um, I... Uh, since I have an older audience, you might remember the, the, the enemy on the Star Trek called the Borg. You know, the Borg. And so the ants are kind of beha behave like the Borg. The Borg could all communicate telepathically. No, you, we are the Borg, and you will be assimilated. Nothing, nothing. Yeah, 
whatever. You got to need some sci-fi fans in here. But the Borg, anyway, the ants seem to operate similar to the Borg. They seem to all know what, the, what, what each other are doing, and they engage in some complex construction projects. Well, these, some ants, they know what to do. You see some ants there holding the leaves together? Some ants know they're supposed to be holding the leaves together. They'll all line up holding the leaves in place while the other, other ants go and get their glue guns, which are actually little, their larvae. They bring their little larvae up, which ex secrete a silken strand. They stimulate this to, to uh, secrete this silken strand, and then they start sewing these leaves together. But well, who's the foreman? Some ants are holding leaves together, others are going and bringing up their larvae, and, and, but who's the foreman? Who's telling these ants what to do? Who gives them their jobs? They, they, are, they are engaged in a, a massive construction project without any apparent communication, but there is communication. There must be a communication. We just haven't yet translated it. Now, this is one of the big mysteries in animal biology is communication. We know animals are communicating. We see a lot of behavior that is communication in nature. Numerous forms of communication have been identified, which include visual displays, um, dance. You think of the dance competitions. That, if you've ever seen the birds of paradise or field hens engage in these dance competitions. There's auditory signals. You can think of bullfrogs that croak to attract mates or uh, monkeys that, are, that give warning calls to warn of predators coming. Um, even, some animals even give calls that are unique to their identity. Dolphins uh, give unique calls for the individual, individual dolphins give unique calls. Some are, ha, is secrete chemical messages, we call pheromones, and we know ants secrete pheromones. There's also uh, tactile or touch-based communication. You see a animals doing a lot of touchy-feely, especially with their little pedipalps, their kind of antenna-like structures touching, but we, it's a, still a big mystery. Now, communication helps animals do a number of things, including coordinating behavior, but almost none of it is, none of their messages have been specifically translated as to their meaning. The only example we can point to at this time is an interesting behavior that was observed in honeybees. What you see here is a, is a honeybee that's doing a little dance on the uh, comb just inside of the doorway of its hive. And when this, was, when this was first demonstrated, it was assumed to be a mating dance, like your birds do these mating dances. But it was eventually realized that what this was was a scout bee that had located food and had returned to the hive and was communicating the location of the food to the hive. It spends several minutes on the combs near the entrance amidst a, a, a closely packed observing bees. And the communication portion of this, of the, of, the, of the dance, really is in the straight portion of the dance. Notice he's doing a figure eight. It's a little figure eight dance that they, we call the waggle, honeybee waggle dance. Well, as it does this little figure eight dance, the waggle portion of the dance communicates information. The waggle, the length of the waggle, tells the hive how far away the food is. With every second, that it's waggling equal to one kilometer. The angle that it does its little waggle is, uh, tells it the direction of the food source in relation to the sun at that moment. And the intensity of the vibration is communicating information about the quality of the food. It's incredible. Man, what makes it even more incredible is that this is the only example of animal communication we've been able to translate. And yet, if a honeybee is communicating specific information, distance, direction, and actually quality of food to, uh, to its hive, what must the mammals be communicating? Your higher animals, like your mammals or birds, I mean, they are clearly engaged in communication as well. Um, we've, we ex we've seen behavior that is clearly communicative in nature, but we haven't yet been able to translate any of it. But it, they, so think about that, it's very interesting. Well, let me point to you, on one of my main focus, uh, focuses here is uh, to help illustrate the incredible design that we find in the animal kingdom. Incredible design that we find. Let me point, give you one example here. Recently, a scientist at the University of Cambridge discovered a remarkable design feature in this tiny little insect called a leaf hopper. And this is a report in the journal uh, Science just back in 2013. Well, this insect jumps as its primary mode of movement and does so over incredible distances and, for, and speeds. 
Its jump is estimated to be uh, close to 12 miles per hour and reach somewhere between 500 and 700 G-forces. Well, as, uh, because of this rapid rate of acceleration, even a, a minuscule discrepancy between the firing of its legs could be catastrophic and send it into an uncontrolled spin, what we call a yaw rotation. So a mechanism for carefully controlling the firing of its legs must exist, and researchers using high power magnification discovered the, the secret behind its powerful jumps. To accomplish this jump, this little leaf hopper was designed with hind legs, the hind leg joints with gears. It has curved cog-like strips of opposing teeth that intermesh and rotate just like the mechanical gears we make. The lead researcher by the name of Mountain Burl stated this about its design feature. He said, the gears in the hind leg bear remarkable engineering resemblance to those found on every bicycle and inside every car gearbox. Each gear tooth has a rounded corner at the point it connects to the, to the gear strip, a feature identical to man-made gears, such as bicycle gears. It's essentially a shock-absorbing mechanism to stop teeth from shearing off. The gear teeth on the opposing hind leg lock together like those in a car gearbox, ensuring almost complete synchronicity in leg movement. They very much resemble gears that we place in both our cars and on bicycles, different attributes. But of course, this extraordinary illustration of design is dismissed as an evolutionary artifact. Malcolm Burroughs states this, these gears are not designed, they're evolved. Representing high-speed and precision machinery evolved for synchronization in the animal world. Now, throughout this article, Malcolm Burroughs refers to design, design, and engineering. But he refuses to accept that design implies a designer that engineering implies an engineer is behind it. So with all of that evidence of design, why state something like this? They are not designed, but, but they're evolved. Well, a couple of reasons why he might have stated this uh, might be something he believed, truly, but it also is very likely a requirement to be published. Because when you discover something like this that has all the markings of design, and if you refer to that, that as being designed, if you compare those designs to our own designs, you better make it sure, make it very, very clear to the uh, editors of that publication that you're not espousing design, actual design. Because if you're talking about actual design, like intelligent design, you won't get published. You gotta make it very clear that what looks like design is not design, they are evolved. You must state that today to be published. Well, more than any other design feature found in the animal kingdom, the ability of animals to fly has caused us to marvel and actually in have great envy. Because, especially because for us, travel has always been something that was very laborious. Uh, traveling, uh, you know, and hi historically, humans were able to travel only six to ten miles, especially when in caravans. And that's why in antiquity, towns were built about six miles apart. Um, and think about getting over a pass, the great effort that it takes to get up and over a pass. Well, we can see birds catching a thermal and riding it skyward, and before you know it, it's already reaching a mountain and mountaintop, and we look at that and, 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 and long for such an ease of movement. Well, we've long marveled at this and long had envy, and this has caused us to, to study the animals that can fly intensely. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, give some examples of this. Insects are known to, uh, in the mystery of insect flight has, uh, has, been, a great, uh, has been a great source of, uh, of investigation, and uh, we've learned a great deal. Uh, in particular, we've learned that insect flight is accomplished largely due to the fact that the front leading edge of the insect wings uh, are creating little mini vortexes or tornadoes. So they're actually creating little mini vortexes on the leading edges of their wings to give them lift. But there's still a lot of mystery behind it, in particular due to the fact that wings, the insect wing beats are incredibly fast. You're talking wing beats approximating or exceeding 200 beats per second. 200 beats per second. Think about that. Think flapping 200 things per second. And uh, so have you ever heard a, an, a mosquito get too close to your ear and hear that high-pitched whine? 
That's 200 beats per second, what that sounds like to your ear. Well, well honeybees beat even faster, like closer to 230 beats per second. And because of this, it's still to some degree a mystery. But back in the 1930s, an entomologist calculated that bees should not be able to fly. They, he, he said it was, they were aerodynamically impossible because of their large body size and their fast wing beat. Their wings beat uh, approximately the same speed as a fruit fly, which is only a fraction of the size of these big honeybees. He, so he said they shouldn't be able to fly. Well, researchers at Caltech use a combination of high-speed digital photography and, and snap freeze frame images of bees in motion and then created a giant robotic mock-up of a bee wing. And they found that bees use an unconventional combination of, of short, choppy wing strokes and a rapid rotation of the wing as it flips over and reverses direction. So to the researchers, to an engineer, perhaps that solves the mystery of bee flight, the fact that they have short, choppy wing strokes and that the wings invert periodically like this to a, a biologist still doesn't solve the mystery to me. But the researchers state this, these animals are exploiting some of the most exotic flight mechanisms that are available to insects. Still, to some degree, a great mystery how they're able to fly. Well, because of this uh, the awe that we have with flight, we have studied bird flight as long back as we possibly could with the hope of being able to create something like that ourselves. Now, one of the most intensive studies of birds going back into antiquity was done by Leonardo da Vinci. He spent 15 years studying birds and did so with the hope that he could mimic the architecture behind bird flight. Uh, he published this in 1505 in a book titled The Codex on the Flight of Birds. And he stated, a bird is an instrument operating through mechanical laws, an instrument it is in the capacity of man to be able to make with all of its motions. Well, in an attempt to make a flying machine, Leonardo da Vinci drew several plans, including this machine, shown here, he refers to as the great bird, or orthoptera. Uh, other plans that he made included a helicopter that uh, had a weird spiral shape. He also uh, designed a hang glider and even a parachute. And some of these are actually engineeringly uh, uh, um, uh, good designs. They actually made his parachute and were able to get it to uh, work and actually sent someone up and tested it. Look at, uh, this is what the wings on the great bird would have looked like. This, these are his designs, those are his uh, uh, diagrams. And this is what it would look like fully fleshed out. It was designed to have a human lay down in it and pump the wings with their, with, with their legs. But at this point in time, the materials they had available were wood and canvas, heavy materials, and a person doesn't have the stamina that's really necessary to uh, pump something like that continuously and, uh, you know, keep it aloft. You know, the last thing you want to do is get 30 meters above the ground and have a cramp, you know, and come crashing back down. But the, the, the design is engineeringly sound. They actually made it with modern materials and attached a, a, a motor to it and were able to get the thing to uh, lift. So it was a good design. Well, this practice the practice of studying God's creation and using it to improve our own designs or develop technologies is a hugely important part of human technological discovery and advancement. Countless technologies could be mentioned here. I'll give you a few. Velcro was developed after studying the way stickers would attach to, to dogs to hair. Some of these uh, seeds are equipped with nice little thorns on the outside of them that will attach well to hair. And they really attach to hair, hair well. They all face in different directions. So once they get embedded in some hair, they can be really tough to get out. And I can speak to this with, uh, with it good experience. You saw my dogs, right? <laughs> Long-haired American Eskimos. Well, in West Texas and New Mexico and places where I've lived, you take those dogs out for a walk through some kind of vacant lot or you know, field, and you can come back with the you know, stickers all up and down the sides of those dogs. And there were times I had just had to shave them out, you know, just had to cut his hair to get those things out. Such a good design. Well, Velcro was a design after studying that. We've also studied termite mounts and have designed buildings at ba based on the design of termite mounts. Uh, what they found is that although it can be ridiculously hot outside, you know, 120 or more degrees outside, they probe the inside of these termite mounts and it's nice, comfy 80 degrees inside. 
And so they studied the architecture of these termite mounts and literally used this design to build buildings. Uh, the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe is one that was specifically designed after studying termite mounts. We've also intensely studied shark skin. Sharks have a, an, a, a, seem to have almost no friction. One little pump of the tail, and they can just slice through the water almost endlessly. So they studied their shark skin, their scales of the sh on their skin, and have designed professional swimwear based on the studies of a shark skin. We've also studied gecko feet. Gecko, ha gecko have the ability to not just cr climb up walls, but can actually go across ceilings. They stick so well to these. Well, the, the key to their uh, attachment is uh, microscopic hairs on these pads on their toes, microscopic hairs that increase electrostatic forces. So like the electrostatic traction when you uh, stick a balloon to a wall, rub a balloon on your head, stick it to a wall, well, increasing the surface area of that greatly will greatly impact that, uh, that ability. And so they have all these microscopic hairs on their, uh, the pads of their fingers that give them a just tremendous grip. And uh, we've studied these intensely and are now using these to design adhesives. And that instead of using glues, which can be toxic, or the production of glues can lead to toxic byproducts. Having uh, these microscopic hairs would uh, eliminate all that. We've also studied humpback whale fins. They, they realized that the humpbacks are exerting some enormous forces with a very slow stroke. And, uh, but, and the notching, if you ever have seen a humpback whale fin, they're notched. And those notchings are an engineering design. With this really slow stroke, those notches help imp imp increase the force dramatically. And so they're using those to improve the uh, function of turbine blades, for example. We've, uh, we've also looked at how, we, how bird wings morph in flight. We create these wings that are rigid structures, but uh, bird wings are constantly in motion. And if you've never uh, seen slow motion imagery of bird wings, uh, take a look at some of those. Not only do the, does the wing morph, but they actually have control over individual feathers. Individual feathers on their wings are controlled. They have muscles that control these individual feathers and can lift those. We've also intensely studied uh, the animals, that wa walking animals and, and such, to, to design uh, robotics, for robotic designs. Um, this has uh, been a common practice, it's going all the way back even to sci-fi days before we were making robots. Like uh, if you're an old Star Wars fan, uh, you know, one of those big uh, quadruped walking robots, I, the name of it escapes me, but those were actually uh, the, uh, um, mock ups of, of elephants, elephants walking along, and they used it to design uh, to, for those robots around Star Wars. But uh, despite this long-standing practice of searching for designs in biology, secular scientists simply refuse to acknowledge what the witness of their own eyes tell them. <clears throat> I want you to listen to a definition. Excuse me, Jeff, I forgot I did have an audio on this slide. Uh, sorry about that. I want you to listen to a, a definition of biomimicry from a scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Now, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is one of our city-sized labs that we have in this country, just these absolute massive research facilities. And so this is a, a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab def given a definition of biomimicry. I just want you to listen biomimicry to Biomimicry is the process of understanding the designs and materials we find in biology and adapting them for human use. So over the millions and millions of years of evolution, there's tremendous wisdom and efficiency in biological systems. Notice that he refers to designs found in biology and the tremendous wisdom behind it. See naturalists, natural scientists, uh, see evidence of design, but they impart that to nature, the wisdom of God. They see evidence of design, but refuse to accept that there's a designer behind it, and even describe that design as having a wisdom but refuse to accept that there's a mind behind it. But where you see design, there's a designer. Where you see wisdom, there's a mind behind it. And that's the word of God. The word of God that's, that's there within all of the creation. Well, animals are so spectacularly well designed that they just cry out, I'm created. But scientists just refuse to acknowledge, again, the witness of their own eyes. And in Romans 1, Paul speaks well to this. He said... <clears throat> This is a good summary of what we're dealing with today. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, 
being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And listen to this. For even though they knew God, they knew there was a creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the nature of science today. They refuse to accept the witness of their own eyes, they have, are becoming futile in their thinking, trying to give credit for such tremendous design features to blind natural processes, refusing to accept what their own eyes tell them, that there is, there is abundant evidence of design in the world. So much design that, uh, professing to be wise, they have become fools indeed. Well, lobsters have an amazing ability to see in extremely dark waters. I mean, they can see in waters that are so dark and murky that we, they should not be, just not be able to see. And this has prompted some intensive studies. Well, it was found that lobsters have a compound eye very different from the, the compound eye we see in insects that give them the ability to intensify incoming light. Unlike the more common hexagonal facets that, uh, that are found in insect eyes, these uh, lobster eyes are equipped with square facets that refract light back onto the retina. Uh, this unique eye design incorporates, uh, an, is, is, incorporates an, a radial array of these, uh, of these facets that give it a 180 degree field of view. But instead of refracting light see, onto the retina, it reflects it from each of these individual facets, intensifying that incoming light. The individual facets are essentially tiny, square-shaped tubes with walls that act as mirrors to reflect the incoming light on the exact same point in the retina, a technology known as reflective superpositioning. Well, developing technology similar to that uh, possessed by the lobster has in in intrigued a number of engineers since the mechanism was first made known. In 2006, UK researchers at the University of Leicester announced that they were developing an X-ray telescope called the Lobster All-Sky X-Ray Monitor. The lobster eye was copied by the Physical Optics Corporation under, uh, the, uh, under some funding by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, they, which uh, they used to implement a design, uh, the design you've seen here, a handheld imaging device known as the Lexid, which stands for Lobster Eye, X-ray imaging device. The, hand, the new handheld imaging system works by emitting low-level ray, X-rays, which are then reflected back and focused by the lobster eye optics. The uh, Lexa device can see through walls of various thicknesses and materials and identify content, which is uh, a current, and it's currently clear enough to re reveal weapons or the presence of humans even behind concrete walls. The, the potential of this has caught the uh, attention of both the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and uh, again was funded in part by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for this reason. Well, I want to point to a number of other very cool examples of design. One of them has to do with the ability of animals to navigate, which means they're able to monitor and control their direction. Uh, now, this ability has been intensely studied, and honeybees have been found to have a remarkable ability, and particularly they're able to navigate in dense vegetation. Honeybee can go up into a bush and with very, very tight foliage can manage to uh, weave its way in and around all of this foliage without uh, getting into trouble, without running into uh, leaves and such. Well, researchers at the Australian National University have uh, shown that bees use a sophisticated motion detecting system they call optic flow. Well, this precision motion detection system is made possible by their compound eyes that have facets that point in different directions, enabling vision over a wide area. But uh, <clears throat> these fa the such eyes are superb for detecting motion since what happens is that the object, as it moves past their field of view, is detected by individual facets one at a time, enabling them to accurately detect the speed at which an object moves past their field of view, and they use that to determine its distance. An object that moves really fast past your field of view is going to be close. Objects that move slower past your field of view are going to be further away. So it's this compound eye that was the key to this. Well, researchers at Lund University in Sweden 
found a completely different mechanism in the green orchid bee you see here. A completely different system. Their primary means of motion uh, mon to monitor and control their movement is in the detection of light intensity rather than motion. They, uh, <clears throat> They use a measure of, they use light intensity as a measure essentially of whether there's enough space to fly through foliage. Well, researchers envision using either the optic flow motion detection system or this light intense, intensity sensing technology that the green orchid bee has for drone navigation. A prototype helicopter has already been developed that can use optic flow to hover in one spot, a major achievement that outclasses remote controlled machines. Uh, when you remote control a machine, you have to have uh, continuous visuals of the machine that you're operating. And, or you have to be able to pre-program it with, uh, with a flight path or send it telemetry data. But you have to have careful control. And if something happens when it's in flight, the machine itself doesn't have the ability to make adjustments. A, a flock of birds come up and boom, you run right into a flock of birds or into a, a turbine blade or such. So these are these, uh, God's designs well outclass our own designs, and we look to these to see if we can improve our own technologies. Well, Emily Baird from, the, from Lund University describes these God-given na navigational technologies as simple, and yet admits that engineers still have not developed their own solutions to the challenges of navigation. They say, the, she says, the coolest thing is the fact that insects have developed simple strategies to cope with difficult problems for which engineers have still not come up with a solution. Well, that's because insects didn't develop those strategies at all. They were, they were given to them by God, a tremendous design that we have found there and long to mimic ourselves, but despite our own, uh, our own wisdom and technological achievements, uh, we find it difficult to uh, even cr make crude designs that can do what God's designs can do. Well, the mechanism used for bird migration has puzzled scientists for years. Now, we have found that birds and various creatures actually navigate by, by different types of monitorings. Um, some uh, monitor the position of the sun as a way of navigating to know where they're going. Some uh, use the moon to navigate or uh, to migrate, excuse me, vast, vast distances. Others have been shown to use stars uh, to navigate. Planetary, uh, planetarium uh, experiments have shown that some actually use stars. <clears throat> and yet there are many that migrate vast distances without having ever been there before and without guides. For example, this is the bristle-thighed curlew that flies unguided and nonstop 5,000 miles from Alaska to tropical Pacific Islands every single year. This is the short-tailed shearwater that migrates 8,000 miles every single year from Australia to Alaska. Now, many birds fly guided meaning some older member of the flock is there out front, one of the more mature, mem mature members of the flock, leading the entire flock off to their roosting ground or, uh, or their feeding ground. And yet both of these examples I give you fly unguided. The parents actually leave before the chicks have fledged. And once the chicks are big enough and uh, are ready to fly, they uh, take off, fly the entire distance having never been there before. Now this is a great mystery. Because, in particular, because these migratory routes had to have been learned. They had to have been learned originally. And somehow that learned behavior, this learned migratory route, now is being passed on to their offspring as innate knowledge. Now, how this happens is a great mystery, but it would be uh, similar to uh, our parents getting really good at calculus, and you're born knowing how to do calculus. Now, that would be awesome, right? No, but, uh, I mean, these are tremendous examples, especially, when you, we, especially from the biblical creation point of view. We know that, consider this, that all animals that are on the earth today were reintroduced somewhere near the, mount, the mountains of Turkey and have migrated to these various regions around the world and have developed these migratory routes based on seasonal demands. They will often migrate to a very inhospitable area to lay their eggs, like very cold, very inhospitable area to lay their eggs where there are a few predators and then they have to migrate back to feeding grounds after the chicks fledge. But, so they've developed these migratory routes based on seasonal demands, learned these migratory routes, and now somehow they're born knowing where to go. This is incredible. Even more incredible is the migration of a monarch. Monarch butterflies also use innate migration capability. 
Now, all the monarchs, the monarch butterflies from all over North America migrate down to Mexico every year. And we're talking uh, as far away as Nova Scotia. Some migrate for 3,100 miles. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen... We've all seen butterflies fly, right? Well, you know, it's kind of a haphazard little floppy kind of flight that they do. And the little things manage to fly 3,100 miles with such a, you know, with such a, you know, a wing type, type of wing stroke. What makes it even more incredible, though, is the fact that none of them have ever been there before. None of them. And yet they all migrate all the way down to Mexico and assemble in this one small little area down in Mexico, a, a location that wasn't discovered until the 1980s. They knew they were migrating, but didn't know where they, exactly where they were going until it was somewhere in the 1980s they, it was finally discovered. Massive, we're talking millions of monarchs assemble in this one small area in Mexico. Well, and there's another interesting uh, thing that happens here. The normal lifespan of the monarch butterfly is very short. Monarchs will lay their eggs in milkweed. This is a, a monarch on a milkweed on that uh, picture on uh, my, your left. That's a milkweed. They lay their eggs on milkweeds, and the caterpillars eat. And that's what caterpillars are, is just eating machines. Eat, 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 eat all day long until they get big enough. And then they'll form the chrysalis and uh, undergo metamorphosis. The, the butterfly hatches out, mates, and dies shortly thereafter. The, the lifespan is usually just a few weeks long. And several generations will occur during the summer while they're in, up in North America during the summer. One generation, another generation, even potentially a third generation. When you reach the generation that is a, getting close to winter, that generation, called the Methuselah generation, lasts for like eight or nine months. That one butterfly makes it all the way down to Mexico and all the way back after, uh, form, after, in, after forming these huge breeding colonies. It's just incredible. But again, none of them have ever been there before, nor have their parents been there before. Usually it's their grandparents or even their great-grandparents was the last generation to ever go down to uh, Mexico. It's incredible. And again, how this uh, learned behavior became encoded, so it has to be encoded somehow and passed on their offspring as heritable knowledge. Well, we know that these mig learned migratory routes, how they became encoded. Um, God reminded Job that such things occur by his wisdom. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and, the, and spread his wings towards the south? No. God has uh, developed that ability, placed that ability in all of these animals. Well, the ability of animals to migrate uh, precisely has puzzled scientists for years. Now, migration requires two things. Uh, you need to know how to, you have to be able to navigate. That's being able to change direction like the, uh, you know, the honeybee or the green orchid bee is able to do with its uh, different kinds of technologies. But you also have to know your direction of travel. You have to know your orientation. Where am I going in relation to where I am now? You have to be able to orient yourself somehow. Well, as I mentioned before, um, discoveries have shown that uh, animals use a wide variety of mechanisms. Um, some use the sun, some use the moon, some use stars. We've even discovered that, uh, that these animals that use the sun don't even have to be able to see the sun, that they appear to be detecting the polarization of sunlight. They know the direction the sunlight is coming from, even if the sun is not physically visible in the, in the sky. But lots of mechanisms have been discovered but a new mechanism was revealed by studies of homing pigeons, or what we would call carrier pigeons. Now, carrier pigeons have been used to, uh, uh, to carry messages all the way back since the time of the ancient Egyptians. Basically, if you have your little colony of carrier pigeons, you can take them and move them to a new location, and they can make their way back pretty easily. And so we've been using these to carry messages, like I say, all the way back since antiquity. And in fact, they were used during both war wars. And a true story, um, true story, in fact, um, 250,000 pigeons were used by the UK forces in World War II. True story. 32 were awarded the Medal of Valor. 32 were awarded the Medal of Valor for their service in World War II. Okay. Well, recently, researchers, uh, in research into homing pigeons was done by the University of Frankfurt, and they found an extraordinary design feature that was possessed by homing pigeons. They have compasses built into their beaks. 
They have magnetic particles in their beaks, actually in the, the, the neurons, one of the uh, a sensory neuron in their beak um, has, a, has these little magnetic particles that enable them to detect the Earth's magnetic field. But they're not just simple little magnetic particles. Listen to uh, one of the lead researchers describe these. Iron containing particles of magnemite and magnetite in the dendrites of these sensory nerve cells are arranged in a complex three-dimensional pattern with different spatial orientation designed to analyze the three components of the magnetic field vector separately, thus acting as a three-axis magnetometer. They have a magnetometer, three-axis magnetometer in their beaks. It's just incredible. Well, one, of, one feature that makes our world so beautiful is, uh, and pleasing to us is the tremendous colors that abound. God has made our world full of colors. And animals have amazing abilities to create colors, but it is one of the parts of, of the creation that just makes our world so pleasing. And uh, I believe he made it that way because he loves us so and wanted to make a home for us that was pleasing. You know, this, the blue that's in the sky just happens to be the color that has the greatest calming effect on us. You know, he made these colors for us. And it's the tremendous color that we see out there that, that makes it so so pleasing to us. Um, the various the colors of flowers and all of the colors you see here on that, on that image are all natural colors that we see in the world. Well, colors in the creation are made variously, but the main way, the reason why different colors exist is because those particles of light we call photons um, have different wavelengths. So there are particles of light that have a wave and they can have a longer wavelength or a shorter wavelength. If they have a longer wavelength, they're at the red end of the visible light spectrum. And if they have a shorter wavelength, they're at the blue end. Okay, so these photons can have different wavelengths and, and uh, cause them to be detected by our eyes as different colors. Okay, well, most of the objects that we see that are colored are colored because they have pigments. Molecules that absorb certain, wave, certain photon wavelengths and reflect others back. So the plants that are green, for example, are absorbing your reds and your blues, but they're reflecting the green back, causing them to appear green to us. Okay? So pigments are very, very normal for colors. And of the image, the image that you see here of this butterfly, the butterfly on the right has, uh, is, has pigments. That's uh, the, most of the pigment that you see there is melanin. The same, it's a ubiquitous pigment that gives us also all of our various shades of browns all the way up to blacks, depending on the density of that melanin. But the butterfly on the left is the same butterfly. That's just the top of its wing versus the underside of its wing. Well, when they, uh, when they looked at the top of the butterfly wing, they realized that it didn't have any pigments that are making it blue. The blue of this butterfly wing is created by iridescence. Now, iridescence is the property of certain surfaces, like the soap bubble you see here, which, uh, causes, which causes them to appear to change color as the angle of view changes. So as you look different at, at, an, at a soap bubble, for example, it can look a little blue or a little purple, and, uh, but, and this phenomena is generally caused by the fact that you're seeing uh, multiple reflective surfaces that uh, in a soap bubble, there's actually multiple layers there reflecting light back, causing it to look like m multiple colors. Well, the blue morpho, although it's, it's blue is due to iridescence, we don't see the various colors like you will see in a, soap, in a soap bubble. In fact, it's a very, very, very uniform shade of blue. Now, I have one in my classroom, and if you tilt it, you can definitely see some purple uh, emitted there, but it's a very bright and brilliant uniform shade of blue. In fact, so bright that pilots have reported seeing blues emanating from the tops of rainforest canopies when, the blue, when this butterfly called the blue morpho is there in concentration. Well, in 2001, uh, a detailed analysis of the blue morpho wing was done and uh, they discovered that it was designed with some very unique scales. Now, all butterfly wings are covered with scales. It actually is what their name means. Um, most of your insect names in an optera, coleoptera, hymenoptera, which refers to the wing. Optera means wing, so coleoptera, like sheath wings or leathery wings, and lepidoptera means scaled wings. This is, this is a, these are a, a, a butterfly scale wings at a small magnification, a very low magnification, using a scanning electron micrograph 
uh, scanning electron microscope that can magnify things up to like 200,000 power, okay? Zoom in a little further, this is 200 power magnification, those scales, butterfly scales. Here's just one scale that you see there, and then I'll zoom in a little further down to 5,000 power, showing the engineering structure that makes this uh, the normal butterfly scale. So this is a normal butterfly scale. And you'll notice they have these long beams that are supported by what we would call joists, little cross bridges that would connect these beams together, all right, along their length. However, upon close examination of the blue morpho wing, they found that their scale was different. Now, this is a, a cross section of the blue morpho wing that you see here, um, and its structural difference is, uh, is made apparent. What you're seeing there is a long beam, uh, but instead of the beams being cr connected with the joists, it appeared like those joists were broken. But when they looked at it through a cross section, they realized instead of Instead of being broken, there were actually what looked like branches all the way down the length of that beam, kind of like a Christmas tree structure. Well, what we know now is that these are actually biophotonic crystals. In, uh, instead of beams being connected together, the, they have these repeated ridges down their length that are all made up of reflective surfaces. The reflective surfaces that are so precisely angled that the wavelengths match and merge with one another, intensifying the, the, the brilliance of the blue light that's coming back at us. But these having multiple reflective uh, layers uh, allows, again, the, the blue morpho design to in intensify this, this, uh, this color, especially when the light is very bright, because it's uh, reflecting the, all of that light back. Every single surface uh, reflects back the same wavelength, causing them to merge together. The, so the light waves complement one another. If the, light, if, the, if the light waves were different, they could actually cancel each other out. But because it's so well designed, it uh, has an intensifying effect. Well, a number of engineers have, uh, have jumped on this concept as well in recent years, uh, following the discovery, again, in the Blue Morpho color production uh, design. Tengen Fibers Limited has made the, the world's first chromogenic fibers called morphotex. So they made fibers that can be used in all forms of uh, textiles that instead of, the, that instead of being colored by pigments, which often can, the production of these can lead to toxic byproducts, it's uh, through controlled iridescence. By carefully controlling the angle that light is reflected back, they can get these fibers to be different colors. Qualcomm developed its, uh, what it calls its Mirasol display device, also using the design of the blue morpho wing. You can see uh, the, blue, the butterfly used there as part of their logo. Um, I have enough time to show you this. So I'll kind of show you what this design looks like. Each pixel on this display can be adjusted independently to uh, reflect light back at different angles, allowing it to re re uh, produce the RGB colors. That, that is what we use to make uh, all of our various colors today. So it's a unique design, but one that is specifically based on the, the blue morpho. It's very, very cool. Well, let me show you one last cool example of uh, an, an amazing ability that's possessed by animals to, that, that, uh, that have control over their own color. Now, cephalopods uh, are just masters of color. Cephalopods include both your octopus and squid and the cuttlefish that is shown here. They're uh, not only masters of color, but they're ac actually also masters of uh, the, an ability to control the texture of their skin. Watch this octopus as it uh, lights down upon a piece of seaweed, changing both its color and texture to suddenly become a piece of seaweed. So incredible ability that, uh, that, they can, that they use for camouflage. And, uh, and, but they, uh, they're masters of color because, uh, like I say, um, there's, animals have a lot of different abilities to produce color or modify their color, but the cephalopods have all of them. Now, uh, they have uh, what are called chrome, uh, chromatophores, which is what you see here. Chromatophores are cells that have pigments in an elastic sac and they can stretch out these pigments to make the pigment uh, more apparent, and then they can shrink up that sac so you can't see the pigment any longer. 
And lots of animals have this. This is the source of the chameleon's color changing ability. These are actually fish, fish scales, okay? But the cephalopods have chromatophores. They also have what are called iridophores. These are tiny stacks of plates that diffract light producing the iridescent colors like we see in the blue morpho, right? And they also have what are called leucophores. These are plates that surround back ambient light. So these are, give them the ability to match the surrounding light, okay? Giving them a camouflage ability. And they also have bioluminescent structures, like we uh, saw with the, the ninja lantern shark. So they have these uh, color, these, uh, the ability to produce light as well. And using these, uh, the, the uh, cuttlefish has an extraordinary, uh, all the cephalopods, but the cuttlefish shown here again, has an amazing ability to blend into almost any environment. Well, the U.S. military has looked into creating this kind of ability, an ability that is called active camouflage. Lots of animals can camouflage themselves. Uh, uh, lots, of, you know, lots of animals have stripes and things that allow them to blend into grasses or like your zebra stripes. You might not think the zebra stripes allow them to camouflage themselves because they're black and white striped, but in a herd of zebras, they all blend together and a predator can't pick one of them out versus the other. Well, uh, again, the, uh, the ability to uh, actively camouflage yourself, we would much, much desire because, uh, you know, oftentimes the, the landscape changes. So a soldier that goes out in a camouflage suit that's made for jungle foliage will stick out like a sore thumb if he has to venture out into a, you know, sandy area. Or, uh, you know, if you're camouflaged for white landscape and you, you end up, uh, you know, in a brown landscape, you're going to, again, stick out like a sore thumb. Well, the U.S. military has looked into active camouflage, but today it only exists in, uh, in theory, theory or uh, what we call proof of concept prototypes, uh, such as this invisibility quote that was de developed here. In 2003, researchers at the University of Tokyo created a prototype active camouflage system that they call retroreflective protective technology. But uh, really all they're doing here <coughs> excuse me, is... Uh, they're taking a recording of the image that's behind the cloak and projecting it onto the cloak. Okay, so a far cry from uh, the type of active camouflage that are used by our cephalopods. Well, animals possess a lot of amazing technologies, and, uh, and I think if we, when we consider that God spent twice as long making the animals as he did any other part of the creation, all of these amazing technologies kind of make more sense. Now, he spent one day creating just the flying creatures and sea creatures on day five. Now, consider this. On day four, he created all of the astronomical bodies, the entirety of the cosmos, all of your stars, all of your planets, your galaxies, your nebula, your quasars, all these astronomical objects were created on day four. And on day five, he created this flying creatures and sea creatures. So arguably, the flying creatures and sea creatures are alone, are as complex as the entire rest of the cosmos combined. Now consider that. Um, but I think that kind of begs a question. Why did he make them? Why did he make the animals? This world, and in fact, the entirety of the cosmos was made for us, okay? We are the purpose for the creation itself. He created us in his image to glor The entirety of the creation was, was to glorify him, but in creating us in his image, he gives us that ability too, to glorify him with our very, very lives. Okay, but why did he create the animals? They are competitors for us in the ecosystem. They can be uh, predators for us. Uh, although the fear and the terror of us was put in the animals after the flood, they are afraid of us, so they were stay away from us. But they can learn not to fear us and uh, can uh, attack us when they learn that. But why did he create them? I think this is a, a poor question. Spent two days on the animals. Fit the fine creatures and sea creatures on day five, the land animals on day six. Spent two days making the animals. And, uh, uh, well, today we use them for food. Right? I mean, that's my purpose of animals. You know, I make a big purpose of animals. When I go to the zoo, that's my big question. I'll take my, se my seventh graders to the zoo every year. Couldn't this year because of, you know, 
<laughs> government shutdowns and stuff. But uh, I love going to the zoo, Willem Park Zoo. I love animals. And so I take my students to the zoo every single year. And my big joke, you know, it's not real. I'm not saying this real. But every, whenever we come up to exhibit, my big question is, mmm, I wonder what those taste like. You know, go to the tapers. Mmm, I wonder what the tapers taste like. Mm. And go to the gorillas. Mmm, I wonder what gor gorillas taste like. I'm always, <laughs> okay. But, never. but we, he didn't create them to be food for us in the beginning. This is specifically stated in Genesis. It says, I give you every green-bearing plant, uh, plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has a breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. So they were not created to be food for us in the beginning. And in fact, they weren't food for other animals either. It's clear from the creation account that, that uh, air, not only were the pl were plants to be our food, but the food for the animals also. So those predatory behaviors began later, after the curse, perhaps worsened after the flood, which is why after the flood he put the fear and the terror of, of us and all the animals, presumably, so that you know, they wouldn't eat us after the flood. We also use animals today as, a, as a commodities, you know, we make things from them, uh, even leather coats and belts and stuff. You know, we all probably have, a have used a little bit of leather, but that, they weren't created for that purpose in the beginning either. God himself was the first person that made clothing out of an animal as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. He, it, it, he made a skin, uh, clothing of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. The first act of, uh, of gracious redemption after they sinned he sacrificed the first animal and lovingly clothed them in a, act, a tremendous act of forgiveness for that very first sin. But he didn't create them in the beginning to be food. He didn't create them in the beginning to be commodities for us. Again, why did he make them? Well, one reason is clearly stated in Job that they would be a witness to us. Job, this is actually Job responding. He says, but now ask the beasts and let them teach you. And, and the birds of the heavens, and let them tell you, or speak to the earth, and let it teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? They were created to be a witness for us. And again, now Paul speaks to this in Romans 1.20. For the, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, are clearly seen in what has been made. And I think... Uh, the, the animals were a big part of that, of that witness to us about God's own glories, his eternal, attrib his eternal uh, his attributes and, his, and divine nature. But I think one of the main reasons that he made the animals for us is because he loves us so much. And, uh, I mean, when you love someone, you want to give them things that they love, right? And there's nothing in the creation that we love more than our animals, you know? I mean, uh, most of us that have made pets of them, I mean, historically, we've always done this. You, you know, we domesticated animals, and, and then a few of those will end up becoming pets, and uh, then you can't really cook them anymore, you know. But uh, we, we love our animals, and if you've ever had a, sadly, they don't live as long as us. So, you know, 15 years is kind of the average lifespan of your cats and dogs, and, and uh, you'll eventually lose them. But, you know, he, he wanted to make a world for us that was both beautiful for us and to provide us things that would not only get, cause us an endless, to be endlessly fascinated by them, but things that we would just love on, you know? So remember that. When you're loving on your dog or you're loving on your cat, thank the Lord for that gift that he gave you. Again, and consider Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Indeed, we can learn much about God by studying his creation, by observing what he made. God made the world full of wonders because he is wonderful. He made it full of beautiful things because he is beautiful. He made things that are tremendously complex and mysterious because he's beyond our understanding. He made things we constantly marvel at because he is marvelous, things of enormous power because he is powerful. Truly, his uh, eternal power and divine nature are, are on display within the creation to reveal himself to us. <laughs> what a wonderful world it is that he made for us. 
And we uh, should not forget that and uh, should not forget to continuously thank him for the world that he's made. Uh, let me close out in a word of prayer. I do, uh, do have a quiz if uh, you want to participate in that like my students do. You'll have to scan that. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much, Lord. We uh, do thank you so much for, uh, for the animals that you have given to us. Animals that we have loved so much. Father God, thank you for this world that you've given us with its beauty, the color. You revealed yourself to us through all of these things, Father God, and thank you for revealing yourself to us in a way that you could, holy as you are, separate from us as you are, Father God, that you revealed yourself to us through your creation, Father God. We, we praise you and we glorify and honor you. And we, we worship you, Lord. Father God, uh, we, uh, we thank you also for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, we uh, humble ourselves before you as sinners, Father God, asking for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord God. Father God, we also come to you asking for uh, your Holy Spirit to fill us and, uh, and to teach us. Teach us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. We, uh, we need... We need your teaching, Father. We need your teaching to help us understand your word. So much history and so much, uh, so much to learn, Father God. Teach us through your Holy Spirit. And Father God, we need your help to understand the world that we live in. Father God, there's so much misinformation out there, so much teaching out there from scientists who do not believe that you are real, that do not believe you created this world, and they're doing their best to, to teach our people, to teach your people that uh, all of this came about through purely natural processes. Father God, help us to understand the science. Teach us through your Holy Spirit. Help us understand the science, Father God, that we may be better witnesses for you, Lord God. Give us wisdom. Fill us with wisdom and insight. Teach us, Lord, that we may serve you. Serve you through a testimony. And Father God, we dedicate ourselves to serving you with our lives as your servants, as your slaves. Give us opportunity, Lord, to serve you. Give us opportunities to witness for you. Father God, and embolden us to speak when the time is right, to tell people about your, what the, uh, cr your creation, to tell them that this world is made, that we're not animals, that you've made this world for us, and that because you love us so much and you want to have a relationship with us, that you are there, a mighty God, capable of speaking the cosmos into existence. Help us to be bold in declaring the truth of what we know that you are there, and that you are watching us, watching over us, that you've made this wonderful world for us, Father God. Help us to be bold in our witness about your creation. Help us to be bold about our, our witness about your Son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who died to pay, this, pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, help us to be bold and declare these truths that we know to all that we see. Help us to be bold, Father God, especially in a time like this, Father God. Help us to be bold, Lord, and help us to speak. Give us the words. Fill us with your spirit. And give us the words, Lord God. Father God, we praise you, glorify and honor you, Father. We give you all glory and honor. We bless you, Lord, for the wonders of the world that you have made. Thank you, Lord God. We praise you and we thank you. In Christ's name, amen.